Allah reward him to give us our talk about the importance of Tawheed, Sheikh Arif from Leicester, for the Tafadl Mashkur, Sheikh. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين ما بعد ask Allah to make this a gathering and a conference of خير and بركة and that Allah accepts it from us and makes us of those who benefit in our dunya and in our akhirah and that رحمة descends upon us and that tranquility surrounds us and the angels lower their wings over the طالب العلم and we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to give us this benefit and that he doesn't forbid us from this kind of rahmah from him and this reward. The topic today is the importance of Tawheed. It's a very important topic because where I'm from in Leicester in the beginning of this month there was a festival which was against this topic. And majority of the world, including in certain Muslim countries, in the coming week they're going to celebrate something which is again against this topic. So it's an important topic, importance of Tawheed, because we all need to know what Tawheed is, we all need to have our identity, we all need to be connected to our Creator, we all need to know our purpose, we all need to know why we are Muslim and why we are not following any other religion. That's why the topic is important. But I want to ask you a question now, and again, uh, here in Coventry we'll have some people saying don't go to Masjid Tawfiq, don't come to Red Lane Community Centre, they are not people who you should be praying besides, you should not attend their conferences, etc. Why are they saying that? Why is there a difference in the Ummah like this? Then we all say La ilaha illallah, we all say La ilaha illallah, so what's the problem? The problem is Tawheed. The problem is not understanding Tawheed, should I say. So you have one person saying La ilaha illallah, he understands Tawheed in one way, and another person says La ilaha illallah, and he understands Tawheed in another way. So I'm going to ask now, what is Tawheed? And before you hasten to answer the question, I'm going to give you four options. What is Tawheed? What is La ilaha illallah? Option number one. There is no creator except Allah. No? Already we've got someone shaking his head. Anybody agree with that definition? There is no creator except Allah. Yeah? La ilaha illallah means there is no creator except Allah. According to us, some people in the room. Okay, so that's one option. The second option. La ilaha illallah means that there is no legislator except Allah. What do you think about that one? No, still. Allah is not your legislator. Is He giving you Sharia? Allah is not your creator. So then how are these wrong? It's not the only one. Okay. Third option. There is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. La ilaha illallah, Tawheed means there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. Who agrees with that one? We've got at least one person, some people maybe still not sure. Yes, another one, we've got two people now. La ilaha illallah and Tawheed means something else. I've not mentioned something. Maybe I'm missing something. Anybody want to add anything that I've missed out as a definition for Tawheed? Now the reason why I've chosen these is because you will find people saying, don't go to Masjid Tawfiq, don't go to Red Lane, come to our mosque, do the things that we are doing. Because they are telling you something about the religion which isn't true. And the reason why they fall into innovation, and the reason why we disagree with them and their definition of La ilaha illallah is because they define La ilaha illallah to mean La khaliq illallah, there is no creator except Allah. And you will find this in many of the books of those people who follow several sects, you will find them even in madrasa books. You will find them even in very expensive madrasa. You open it and it says, La ilaha illallah means there is no creator except Allah. This is a message that's being pumped all around the ummah. And if you ask people on the street, what is La ilaha illallah, what is Tawheed, what does it mean to believe in one God, they will say, he's my creator. But that is problematic because the Quraysh believed 
and Allah being the only creator. They knew that. Therefore, when people end up worshipping worshiping others besides Allah and they make tawassul besides Allah, they say, how can you call me some, somebody, doing, somebody that is doing shirk? How can you say I'm doing shirk? Because I've got la ilaha illallah. What's his definition? There is no creator except Allah. You see the problem? That's one thing. The second possible solution that we've got here of what la ilaha illallah is as a definition is that there is no legislator except Allah. Let me ask again, does anybody who agrees with this one still know? Why not? Okay, let me give you an idea now, yeah? Does anybody here, and I'm sure, inshallah, nobody will say yes, anybody here thinks that it's part of your religious obligation of living in this country to get a knife, go on London Bridge, and look for people who are not Muslim and start killing them? Is that what la ilaha illallah is? It can never mean what la ilaha illallah is. Therefore, the biggest or the second biggest fitna that we're facing in the ummah today is because of those people who defined la ilaha illallah, meaning as there is no legislator besides Allah. And what that means is, is that if you are not establishing the legislation of Allah, then I am against you. And I will use violence, and I will use insults, and I will use whatever I need to do to make sure that the legislation of Allah becomes established. And I will die trying. That's why now, me and you, we think, Islam is so beautiful. Rasul, he was such a nice man. How can someone do this under the name of Islam? How can they do this under the name of the Mus'haf? How can we all read the same Qur'an and a person do something so silly? It's because their definition of Tawheed is that they have to do it. And they would do it to me and you as well. There is no difference. Except those people there on London Bridge, they're a little bit worse than us. But haven't they attacked Mecca? Haven't they attacked Medina in the past? And until today, they're doing it. Therefore, the definition that there is no legislator except Allah creates this problem of violence and extremism. The first definition is that there is no creator means that worship... You can worship however you want. There is no set way. As long as you are saying Allah is your creator, you can have ta'weed and you can go to the qabr and ask the person in the grave and you can do whatever you want because I have said la ilaha illallah. My idea of la ilaha illallah is there is no creator except Allah. The second person who has defined la ilaha illallah as being there is no legislator, he will now justify violence and war. But the people of Iman, the true people of Iman, the true people of the Sunnah will define La ilaha illallah, meaning that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. Allah is one, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is one in his lordship. Worship belongs to him alone. He is one in his uluhiyyah. And he is one in his names and his attributes. And these are the three categories I'm sure everybody has heard of when it comes to La ilaha illallah. But because our topic is talking about the importance of la ilaha illallah and not the categories and the types of la ilaha illallah, we will just leave that as part of the definition, which is that tawheed means to worship Allah alone, to single out Allah as your Lord alone, and to single out Allah in names and attributes alone. But just briefly, we'd like to mention, what is a Lord The first line in the Quran is Alhamdulillahi Rabbilah. You, you can't say Allah will not be acceptable without that. Everyone says it. Children say, adults say. What is a Lord? What is a Rabb? Yes? Someone who has the power. Someone who is in charge. Somebody who is in power. Is that it? No, no. Someone who provides things. Excellent. Okay, we're getting somewhere now. So now the Rabb. And this is a general principle. Whenever you have a name or an attribute of Allah, it normally has more than one meaning. More than one meaning. What is the meaning of Rahman? What is the meaning of Rahim? What is the meaning of Malik and Quddus? Normally it will have more than one meaning. But let's go to Rabb. Rabb has four parts to it. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your creator. After he created you, what happens? He's brought you into existence. Now what? He leaves you. He sustains you. He provides for you. And then he continues providing for you. He gives you sustenance. But there's a fourth thing. So now he'll put you in the dunya. He gives you sustenance and he gives you risk. Is that it? 
He gives you guidance and a way to live your life. That's what a Rabb does. And there is no Rabb besides Allah who can do that. That's the first category of Tawheed. The second category of Tawheed is that all acts of worship belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is worship? Salat, Siyam, is that worship? Or the examples of worship? Examples of what's worship? Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, Al Ibadah. Worship, huwa ismun jami'un. It is a comprehensive term for everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves internally and externally. Min aqwal wal af'al in your statements and your actions. So anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves is an act of worship. Salah is an act of worship. Siyam is an act of worship. If you go home, And your wife says to you, don't sit like that, I don't like it. Then if you sit in a way which is proper, is that act of worship? It becomes an act of worship if you have the intention. Something so simple becomes an act of worship because why? Allah loves it that you behave nicely, that you don't annoy people, that you make people happy, that you spread kindness, you spread gentleness. And if you think about it, I think, no, she didn't like it. And if I do it, she'll become happy and Allah will be pleased with me. Good deed will be written for you. Act of worship is done. Therefore, this is something which this ummah has. And it's a rahmah and it's a grace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you will find other religions spending hours and hours and hours trying to do acts of worship. Whereas for the mu'min, the Muslim, his whole life can become an act of worship. If he has two conditions. Worship is only accepted if you have two conditions. The way you sit, the way you eat, the way you go to the bathroom, the way you wake up, the way you wear your clothes, all of these things become an act of worship if you have two conditions. Number one, what are those two conditions? I'm sure you've heard them before. The class and, yes? According to the sunnah. There has to be a scholar saying to you, listen, this is how you wear your clothes. And there's the evidence for it. And sometimes it might be not according to the sunnah, but it might just be ikhlas. You're walking down the street, you see something is tipped over, you put it up. Allah will be pleased with me because I want to get his jannah. The third one is that Allah has names and attributes and actions which are exclusive to him, Jalla wa'ala. So is there anyone else that can be called Allah? Is there anyone else that can be called Rabb? Is there anyone else that can be called Rahim, Rahman, etc.? No one else. Now this is very important. The reason why... Names and attributes are part of Tawheed because number one, it t- teaches us who Allah is. Number two, it then creates a connection between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want rizq? You have a Lord that gives you rizq. He's a rizq. If you want honor and you want stability and you want peace in your life, you have a Lord that can give you that. He is al-aziz. If you want kindness to be shown to you because, you know, you're going through a difficult period and you want some kind of release, he is, he is Rahman, he is Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us who he is so that then we know who he is and we can single him out for that. So therefore there are two points with that. We know who Allah is, his, that is his introduction to us. And number two, he creates a connection with us and Ar-Rahman, our Lord, Jalla wa ala. But there's a third reason that the ulama mentioned, which is that Whenever a group of people have fallen into making shirk and kufr, what's the first step that, we, that they will do to fall into kufr and shirk? So if you have a tree here, nice beautiful oak tree, if somebody comes and says to you, ask this tree or put, wipe the tree and it will give you blessings. No sane person will think, this is just a tree, can't do that. So then how can people end up worshipping trees and stones? Because people are still doing that until today. How? How is that possible? Allah says in several places in the Qur'an that what they do is they invent names and attributes for other than Allah and they give it to other than Allah and then that justifies them to worship that thing. Is that still happening now or is it not happening? How? Let me give you an example. If you have a man... 
and he is a man. But whenever he wants, he can become a spider and a man whenever he wants. Allah's got nothing to do with it. We've got nothing to do with it. He decides himself. I will become a spider and a man. I will create myself in the way I want, whenever I want. Is that shirk or not shirk? Why? Because it's from the categories of Tawheed to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your Lord and He has names and attributes and those names and attributes are only for Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have a man who can see through the walls, he can see everything in the dunya. And just by looking at you, he can make you feel hot, he can make you feel cold or... Is that competing with Allah as al-Basir or not as a not competition? Of course. Therefore, this to- this topic is very very important. In actual fact, I'm sure you've seen Kitab al tawheed and other books which address this topic. And in Kitab al tawheed we have more than fifty, nearly sixty chapters, maybe even over sixty chapters, which talk about this. So it's not possible for us to talk about the whole topic of tawheed today. We need to stick to the title, which is the importance of tawheed. And Allah says several places in the Quran that this topic is extremely important. Allah says in the Quran, You alone we worship and you alone we ask for help. Therefore, we need to learn what Tawheed and Uluhiyya and Rububiyya, etc. is. Allah says in the Quran, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ Learn. The ulama said, فَعْلَمْ Learn. Know. Have knowledge. Be certain of. Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهِ what does Qul mean? Why does Allah say to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say Allah? The ulama of tafsir have said, Qul means say with firm certainty and iman. Uh, there's a notice here, there's a silver golf registration, 57 plate is blocking someone outside, if they can move the car as soon as possible, please. Silver golf registration, 57. Qul, be firm, have knowledge. Don't fall in the opposite of who Allah is. So Allah is commanding us to learn. Allah says in several places in the Quran, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ رَحِيمُ وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيبُ وَعْلَمُوا Know, have knowledge, have certain that Allah is such and such. Allah does such and such. وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ Know that you're going to go back to Him. Why? Because He's your Lord. وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الْمُتَّقِينَ that Allah will assist you through His names and His attributes for those people of ta- taqwa. And there are many ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to learn who He is. Okay, now we know what tawheed is. We know the categories of tawheed, etc. What are some of the virtues of tawheed? Now unfortunately, like we've said, most people, we have nearly 2 billion Muslims in this planet. I will say most of the ummah, do not give this topic importance. And because of that, that's why we are divided. That is the reason. There's no other reason. So if you have a person who says Allah is my only creator, or if you have a person who says that Allah is my legislator, this is the reason why they end up doing things, because your foundation is that, that is your belief. The foundation of everything will then create the branches and the fruits, etc. So if you see the fruits of a tree, why is the fruit like that? It's because the, corrupt, the, the foundations are corrupt. The trunk is corrupt. If the fruit is nice, if the vegetation is nice, if everything is looking nice, the tree looks beautiful. Why? It's because it has been done properly from the beginning. So why is Tawheed important? Ibn Qayyim has a very long piece, and I want to read this out to you because it is beautiful. He said, Rahimahullah, despite all of the benefits of Tawheed, despite all of the benefits of the name Allah himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala, The most knowledgeable of all creation on a habitual basis was reduced to say, لا أحسي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah is saying that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most knowledgeable of Allah, the best of mankind, the one who is to worship a great deal, the one who will make sujood, on Yom Al-Qiyamah, on a day when nobody else can make sujood, Nuh will say go to somebody else, Ibrahim will say go to somebody else, until they get to Muhammad Wasallam, and he will go underneath the Arsh of Rahman. This is the, the strength of his Tawheed. There's nobody stronger in his Tawheed and his Iman than Muhammad But what did he used to say? Ibn Qayyim saying here, 
in his night prayer, in his kunut, he used to say, La uhsi thanana lake, I cannot thank you and praise you enough. I cannot count them. So what he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on a habitual basis, anta kama athnaita ala nafsik, you are as you have praised yourself. I cannot praise you enough. So Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is saying, if that's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then there's no way that we can truly understand who Allah is and the virtues and the importance of Tawheed. However, Ibn al-Qayyim lists the importance in the things that we, we kind of, so, so, certain things we know about, sort of know in our life. He said, rahimahullah, how could we ever count all of the benefits of Tawheed and from the name of Allah when all perfection belongs to Him and it's mentioned, the name of Allah and it's mentioned. When? We can't count it, we cannot enumerate, we cannot limit the virtues of Tawheed. And this shows you the importance of this topic. When? All praise and thanks are for Allah. When? Allah is exalted and all of the dominion is for Him. Importance and the virtue of Tawheed. All splendor and majesty belongs to Him. All honor and all beauty return back to Him and to Tawheed. All good and all benefit come from Tawheed. All virtue and all piety only ever exist because of Tawheed. Nobody can ever become pious without Tawheed. This name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Tawheed is never mentioned on something insignificant except it becomes significant. The name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never mentioned upon something insignificant Except after the mentioning of Tawheed over that thing, it becomes significant. It's never mentioned in the times of fear, except the thing that they fear is removed because of it. Tawheed is never mentioned in the times of difficulty, except ease is brought by it. Tawheed is never in a person in times of sadness, except that Allah will replace that sadness with joy. Tawheed is never in a person in times of strain, except that there will be a way out that will be shown to him, and an alternative will be brought. Tawheed is never used and mentioned and had and existed inside of a weak person, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives that person strength. Tawheed is something that is mentioned by anybody who is debased, who is low, Except that Allah will give him honor and uprightness. Tawheed never exists inside a poor person except that Allah will give him richness. Tawheed is never inside in somebody who's got bad manners and he's a bit rude and his words are not so good. Except that through the virtue of Tawheed and his connection with Allah, his manners will improve. Tawheed is never there in the person who is being oppressed. Except that through his level of Tawheed, he will find liberation either inside of his heart or in his body, in the physical. Tawheed is never inside of a person who is lost. Lost could be literally lost physically or lost spiritually. Except that he finds his way. This is something, Ibn Qayyim continues, this is something, Tawheed, which removes all hardships. It replaces the hardships with blessings. And it gives a response to a person when he worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The name of Allah and Tawheed is said by those who slip. Tawheed is going back to the person who has made a sin. And he goes back to Tawheed except that Allah will expiate it for him. Through the virtues of Tawheed, he will have his rewards increased and multiplied. Because of Tawheed, all of the heavens and everything that is inside of it, and all of the heavens and the earths and everything that is inside of it and between them exists because of Tawheed. Because of Tawheed, all of the books were revealed. Because of Tawheed, all of the messengers were sent. Because of, all, because of the Tawheed, all legislation was sent down onto earth. It's because of Tawheed we have a strict way of life. We have a life of obedience. We have boundaries. Because of Tawheed, because of those boundaries, we have humanity in our souls. And with that humanity, we can spread peace and joy and remove grief and oppression. Because of Tawheed, the reality and the inevitable will befall upon a man 
and he will be ready for it. What is the reality in the inevitable? Death. al and al Because of Tawheed, the scales will be brought down and Allah has made scales because of Tawheed. Because of Tawheed, Allah will make the way because of Tawheed. Because of Tawheed, there's a sirat between over the, 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 the fire of Jahannam and everybody will need to pass through it because of Tawheed. Because of Tawheed, people will either end up in Jannah or they will end up in the fire. Because of Tawheed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for this purpose. Because of Tawheed, we will be resurrected. Because of Tawheed, we will enter into our graves. Because of Tawheed, that is the first question that you will be asked. Because of Tawheed, people will dispute in the dunya and they will be judged in the akhirah. It's because of Tawheed, there is only love and disassociation for it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you know, Ibn Qayyim is saying now, if you know and you live by Tawheed, you will be happy. You will have tranquility, you will have blessings, you will know why you are here. And those who don't know Tawheed, and those who do not live by it, they will never be satisfied. They will always be in a state of worry and dissatisfaction. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said, Tawheed is the hidden secret of the creation. It is the hidden secret of everything that exists. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there will be a day where he has made everything so beautiful. And because of Tawheed, Ibn Qayyim is saying, he will rip it up and he will break it as if it never existed. Now we know what Tawheed is. Now we know the virtues of Tawheed. And now we realize that not all people are guided to Tawheed because not everybody has the right definition. We also now realize that Tawheed is extremely important because of the virtues that are surrounding it. But Tawheed is also very important because it is commanded in the Quran over again. And as Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah has said, nobody will enter into Jannah without this Tawheed. But now the question is, why is Tawheed so important? So we've looked at the definition, we've looked at the virtue, but now we're asking the question is, looking a bit more deeper now, why is Tawheed so important? Point number one, humans in our own fitra, in our nature, if there is a doubt in our head about our belief, we cannot have sabr with that, we cannot have patience with that. But if it comes to actions, normally humans can bear it with patience, especially when they know that it's only going to last for a period of time and then it'll be over. Let me give you an example of this. Have you ever met somebody who has left Islam because fasting for 18 hours, 19 hours, 20 hours is too difficult? Have you ever met somebody who has left Islam because five, five daily prayers is too difficult? Or is it that most of the people, they will fast with difficulty, or even if they don't fast, they say, no, I'm still a Muslim, but it's too hot. Five times a day, I'm still a Muslim, I'll pray once a week. I know I should be praying five, but I'll pray once a week. Why? It's because by human nature, if you're going through a difficulty, you have to do something hard, you will bear it. It's your body, it's fine. You can cope, Allah has created you strong. But your heart is soft. Your iman and your heart needs to be strong. And if it is not strong, then you will not be able to have sabr with it. And when you are not having sabr with it, then you are becoming in a state of confusion. You will find yourself in a state of confusion. You might become dissatisfied. Some people will fall into major sins. Some people will end up being atheists. Why me? Why is this all happening to me? Why is there so much oppression in the world? Why is it always me that I get into car accidents? There can't be a God. What's happened to my son? He was only five years old and he died. There can't be a God. Why? It's because their aqidah is shook. Their iman, their tawheed is shook. And they have no answers. When they have no answers, there is a very big problem. 
But if you ask this person, wake up, go to work, 9 to 5, come home, go to the gym, you know, take your children here and there, etc. It's hard, it's difficult, but he can do it. That's because his body is made for it. Even if he gets tired, his body is... But his iman, his heart is weak. And if it is not strong, with a little bit of fitna, with a little bit of a test, it's gone. It's finished. Now that then can lead to confusion. So a person will still carry on praying, but there might be a little bit of nifaq now. And a little bit of, I'm not sure about Islam, I'm not sure about... I'll still carry on because astaghfirullah, I'm a Muslim, but I don't know. I mean, maybe it is true that Islam is not 100% right. Maybe there are problems, I just don't know. You find that. Confusion will come. Dissatisfaction will come. And then you will find some people falling into major sins because why? The Tawheed is not strong. It's because the Tawheed is not strong. So when you say to the brother, Akhi, listen, work for the Akhirah. Don't do the major sins right now. All the alternatives, you will find them in the Akhirah. You want to drink alcohol? Leave it. Have sabr in the Akhirah. You want to have wives? You want to have women? Leave it in the Akhirah. You want to have a nice big house? Don't get the riba mortgage. 12 raka'ah today, you'll have it in the Akhirah. Have some sabr. He can do the actions, but if his iman is not strong, if there is a problem with his aqeedah and his tawheed, you will find him still saying that he's a Muslim, but he's, he will fall into major sins. And the worst case scenario, you will find people falling into atheism. And this is true, because now you find a person, you give him the whole dunya, he's a billionaire. How many billionaires are there? You find them billionaires. He's doing all of the things that you could possibly think in the dunya is making him happy. He's got houses, he's got cars, he's got drugs, he's got alcohol, he's got women. Everything that he wants, everything. He just clicks the fingers, he's there. But then you read the news, oh, such and such person has committed suicide. Such and such person, he's in jail. Such and such person, he's done this wrong, he's done that wrong. He's had a problem with his wife. She doesn't like him anymore. Why? This is because your heart is weak. It doesn't matter how much dunya you have. This is the importance of Tawheed. And Allah says this several places in the Quran, but one example, Allah says, al min Rabbik. This is Tawheed from your Lord, and it is the truth. فَلَا تَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْمُمْتَرِينَ Do not be like those people who don't know. Therefore, the importance of this topic is to make you a human being. Is to make your heart and your iman strong. Doesn't matter what your body goes through, but it's to make your heart and your root and your foundation firm so that it never becomes of those things that deviate, even if it's just the slightest of tests. That's point number one. Why is it so important? Point number two is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me give you an example. If I have this piece of paper, and I switch this microphone off, and I have this piece of paper, and now I'm going to use this, mic- this, this piece of paper as my microphone, what would you say about this person? Can you hear me? You can't hear me. Why? What's wrong? I'm using, I'm using a microphone. Is this not a mic? Can you hear me? Can the sisters hear me? You think this is sanity or not sanity? Let me give you another example. I want to contact my wife. Let me try to use this bottle of water. There's no numbers. Uh, can I contact? You sure? Is there an app on here somewhere? Why? What am I doing? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive shirk. And these examples are examples of people who are following shirk the same thing. You have been created, and Allah through His mercy is not just giving you one year, 24 hours, He's given you 60, 70, 80 years to perfect all heat. And there is nobody on the face of this earth except a small minority. There's nobody on the face of this earth except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at some point will show him, look, this is the right way. Here's your choice now. This is your decision now. Here's your choice. And you find that people are becoming Muslim every single day. And very rarely do you find people leaving Islam. Like we've said before just a moment ago, you will find people becoming weaker in their iman, but they will still say they are Muslim. Why? Is it because they've tasted at least some of that firmness, some of that tawheed. 
So they don't want to let that go because they know that is the firmness. If I let that go, then there's nothing left. Then there's no restrictions. I'll be completely confused in my body and I'll be completely confused in my iman. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through His mercy, He gives people a chance. He gives you 60, 70, 80 years to understand what Tawheed is. And this is a piece of paper and this is to write on, to record information on. This is a bottle of water for you to open and to drink. It's not a communication device. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive shirk. And the reason for that is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says in more than one place in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive shirk and He will forgive anything which is lesser than that. That is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us here to understand what Tawheed is. Because that is the reason why you have been created. It's the only reason why you've been created. It's the only reason why you've been given eyes and ears and your senses and your faculties. It's the only reason why you have a soul. You take the soul out of my hand, it's not going to move. It'll become literally like that. Why? Why is, it, why is my hand not doing that when I lift it up? Why? Only one difference. Allah has put something inside of me so that I can understand what Tawheed is. Therefore, if you had 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years of a chance to get that right, and you still haven't understood what your purpose is in life, then there is a problem. The importance of Tawheed now teaches us why we need to understand the purpose and what happens if we don't understand the purpose. The third Excuse me. The third reason why Tawheed is important is because without Tawheed, you can never become a good human being. Question number one, we asked, why is Tawheed so important? And we answered in a summary, we'll summarize now, is because it gives you the purpose of life. The second, when you're using the paper as a microphone, that person there, that is the effects of a person not knowing why he exists. But the third question is now, now I understand my purpose, now I understand what I shouldn't do, because if I don't use it correctly, I'm going to corrupt myself, I'm going to corrupt my iman, I'm going to corrupt my body. The third question is, I understand my purpose, and I understand I shouldn't be following into shirk, and that is for my own benefit. But how is it then that I can become a good human being? How is it then that I can become a beautiful person? How is it then that I can uh, achieve my potential? Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he gives the example that without Tawheed, a person can never become beautiful, and a person can never become upright, and a, never, a person can never become and attain his full potential in the dunya or in the akhirah. And he gives an example. If a person has some najas or some urine or some feces on his clothes, would you wear it? Or would you throw it in the wash? Everybody, unanimously, I think, even Muslim, non-Muslim, you throw it in the wash. Okay. What if there was only a little bit? Would you still wear it? No. What if there's only a little bit and you washed it and you said, okay, I'm not going to put it in the wash. I'll just put some water over it and I'll clean it. No, it's okay. But I can still smell it. And the colour and the stain is still there. It's annoying me now. What would you do? Take it off, throw it in the wash. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah is saying. Therefore, the cleaner your garment, the nicer the life. The cleaner the garment, how do you look on Yomul Jumu'ah? Do you look like that, that on Monday morning? On Yomul Jumu'ah, brush your teeth, perfume, nice clothes. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is saying, the cleaner the garment, the nicer the appearance. The cleaner the garment, the nicer the life. And the more nicer and the more cleaner your garment is, then the more it will benefit you, your body, and the more it will benefit other people around you. I like, I like his stove, I like his mashallah, it looks beautiful. I'm going to dress like him tomorrow. You see the point? Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, it will be good for his body and it will be good for other people. 
the garment is nice, the appearance is nice, it's affecting other people. But Ibn Qayyim gives another example, he carries on. We give the example of Najas and it doesn't smell very nice. He's actually got perfume on. And he smells very nice. And when I, when I hold his hand and I give him the salam, I can smell it. And I drive all the way back to Leicester, I'm still smelling the Bible. You know? Arqab, mashallah, misk. I can smell it. Oud. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah is saying, if this is the way your iman is internally, your appearance will change. Your actions will change. You will then emanate beauty. You will have an effect on your own body and you will have an effect on other people. What is the very first command after Iqra? Or what is, what is the very first command that the Prophet ﷺ was given to make him a messenger? Ya ayyuhal muddathir Wrapped up in your garments. Qum fa'anzir Stand up and warn them. Warn them about what? Wa rabbaka fakabbir Glorify and extol your Lord. Exalt him. Wa thiyabaka fatahir. Purify your garments. From what? The ulama of tafsir have said from shirk. The next ayah. Wa rujza fahjur. Leave shirk and everything that's there. Purify your garment with tawheed. Wa la tamnun tastakthir. Wa li rabbika fasbir. Wa la tamnun tastakthir. What does that mean? If somebody does something good for you, don't expect a reputation for yourself afterwards. Don't expect payment and think, yeah, I want, I want to check for that. I helped you reverse your car. I helped a woman across the street. And she didn't even say thank you. When you are good, the Prophet ﷺ, the very first command of Islam, imagine. Allah says from, from the very beginning, have tawheed, purify yourself, be good to other people. Don't do this for the sake of Becoming, you know, high in people's esteem. Don't do it for the sake of the dunya. Wali Rabbika fasbir and for your Lord be patient. What is patience? How do you define patience? It's good we're asking very important questions because these words we are using on a daily basis. And if we don't have an answer straight in our head, then maybe we need to. What is tawheed? What is. You persevere, okay, good. The ulama have said in Arabic, as sabr is habs nafs. And habs refers to you imprisoning and guarding and, and protecting yourself from doing the things that you shouldn't be doing. Therefore, look at what the ayat are saying here from Surah Muddathir. Allah is commanding the Prophet ﷺ with Tawheed. And with that, he is beautifying himself. And the command with that also, he's protecting himself from those things which doesn't belong for a person who wants to enter Jannah. You want to enter Jannah? How are you going to get to Jannah? Remember the first question, purpose of life. How do you stay away from not getting into Jannah or the other place? Don't do what is not the purpose of life. But then the third thing... How can you then behave like the people of Jannah without Tawheed? It's not possible. How can you go home and be good to your children and be good to your family without Tawheed? It's not possible. Therefore, like we've said before, everything can become then an act of worship. Everything can become an act of worship when you know what Tawheed is. And the more you improve it, like Ibn Qayyim here is an example that he's giving of the garment. And the more you do that, the more you will see changes in your life. And again, we're here talking about the importance of Tawheed and not how to make those changes, because that's a separate. But now, at least, if you walk away from this lesson, you think, I need to do something about my Tawheed and my Iman, that is a good thing. And then you start learning what Tawheed is and what Iman is and improving on that and then acting upon that, then that is a good thing, because that is the objective of this lecture. The next thing, point number four, once a person knows the purpose of life, question number one. Now he is staying away from shirk, question number two. Now he has a good life because he's becoming a good person. He's changing. He's having a bit more of good deeds and good actions and he's speaking nicely. He stops swearing. He stops smoking because he is 
So he wants to prepare to meet Allah. He's praying his salawat. She's wearing the hijab. He's becoming a better person now. What's the next thing? What's the next thing that a person should have? Consistency. Steadfastness. Carry on. Don't give up. Have sabr. The people of Tawheed, they have high ambitions. The people of Tawheed, they don't want the food of the dunya. The people of Tawheed, they don't want the drink of the dunya. The people of Tawheed know that no matter how beautiful you are as a human being, a man or a woman, they still have to go to the bathroom. They still sweat. They still have bad smells coming from their mouth. They still cut it open, it's still flesh and bone, all of this. The people of Tawheed know that this device here, your phone, is just nuts and bolts. The car, nuts and bolts. No matter how beautiful you make this wall and you make it into a big mansion, at the end of the day, what is it? You break it down, what is it? What is the substance? It's just sand. That's the reality of the dunya. The people of Tawheed know this reality. And this is the reality that helps them have high ambitions. What are their ambitions? Jannah. Therefore, the importance of Tawheed in a person, in his life, is that it will create high ambitions for that person. Without Tawheed, people will live for the dunya. Even if the person says, La ilaha illallah, you will find him becoming a little bit weak in his salat. Why is he becoming weak in his salat? Because if you've got an option of Salat al-Dhuhr or Salat al-Asr or Salat al-Maghrib or watch your favorite football team now you don't even think about the Salat and you thought about the Salat and you think, yeah, it's pretty little or I might not even pray at all what's he doing? he's preferred an aspect of the life of the dunya so his Iman and Tawheed has gone down for the sake of living in the dunya this is just one example but you can make that example as many as you can stretch it as far as you want but the people of Tawheed, they know the purpose of life. When the call comes, when it's 6 o'clock in the morning, when it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon, this is the reason why Allah has created me. There is no other time, there's no other reason why Allah has given me 1 o'clock. There's no other reason. What's the reason? Salah. There's no other reason why Allah has given me my brother here. There's no other reason why Allah has given me my mother. What is the reason? To be good to them. To make things easy for them. To seek Allah's face. And to enter his gym. Everything. To drink this water. Why is Allah giving me this water? Say Bismillah. Nourish myself so I can do something good with it. I say Alhamdulillah afterwards. There's no other reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the people of Tawheed that high ambition. Because all of these things that they have around them is helping them to go back home to Jannah. After we know the purpose of life. After we know what we shouldn't do, question number two. After we know, question number three, that it can become a good person. After question number four, we know now that we need to remain firm on this way and don't let it go now because you've got something which is very good. What's next? This is a very important question because you will find a lot of Muslims praying five times a day, going home, going to sleep, and the routine is like that. Five times a day, going home, going to sleep, work, home, sleep, five times a day, and that's it. They're consist- they know the purpose of life, they're not falling into shirk, their manners are all good, I mean, there's no major sins or anything, I mean, he's a nice guy. And he's doing it every day. But there is a small deficiency in this person's life, and this is advice to myself more than anybody else. The fifth thing for the importance of Tawheed is that the person who has Tawheed seeks Allah's acceptance by improving. By improving. There's no such thing as too much Tawheed. There's no such thing as too much good deeds. There's no such thing as me saying, I'm safe. Can't you see all those people there? 
They're crazy. They fall away from any religion. At least I'm, I'm upon the right way. I'm praying my salawat. I recite some Quran every day. It's not enough. The people of Tawheed are scared that they haven't done enough. The people of Tawheed want to improve and become better. If a person says to you, give me one pound and I will give you 700 pounds in return, guaranteed, what would you do? Imagine if you didn't have a pound. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, with one good deed, you have a minimum of 10. <clears throat> and a maximum of 700. With one good deed. You say, subhanallah, what happens? One good deed? That's fair, isn't it? One for one? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through his mercy and his love for the people of Tawheed, and his grace upon the people of Tawheed, and his respect for the people of Tawheed, he said, no. You pray five times a day, I will write it that you've paid 50. And the Thaymeen Rahimullah said, that 50 doesn't mean 5 times 10. And the Thaymeen said, if you say that's 5 times 10, then there is no virtue for Salat. If a person says, subhanAllah, that's 1 times 10 already. So if I'm praying Fajr, that's 1 times 10, then there is no difference. Ibn Thaymeen Rahimullah said, that that 5 is 50. That five is fifty. And then it can get multiplied by ten again. Minimum. So now why wouldn't a person of Tawheed want to improve? When you're getting a minimum of five hundred for your salawat ten, five times a day, that can then get times from fifty to seven hundred. Every single day you can become a billionaire. So let me ask you that question again. I give you a pound. You give me a pound, I'll give you 700. What would you think? I want it right now. Can I give you 10? You give me 7,000? That's the people of Tawheed. The people of Tawheed want to improve. What am I doing that's wrong? Why is there uh, not the, the improvements in my life? Why am I not seeing? I'm praying and I'm fasting and I'm doing those things, etc. And sometimes you will find that, you will find people practicing and they are praying, etc. But <clears throat> they still have problems in their home and things like that. Why is that? The answer is, they are not improving. They know the purpose of life, they're staying away from shirk. They're good people themselves. And they are steadfast, but the improvement is missing. And without that improvement, you will not always see the fruits. So the people of Tawheed are always checking themselves. Am I doing enough? Am I being honest with myself that this thing that I'm doing, that I'm addicted to, I, I really need to stop it now for the sake of Allah? And you do that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you. With this now, and this, like I've said, this is probably one of the most important questions, which is, you know, that the person keeps improving. The next question that comes from this how do you know that Allah has accepted your deeds? None of us see Allah, none of us speak to Allah, but Allah can see us. And Allah speaks about us. Does Allah speak about us? How do we know? Where? Yeah, what's that? What's the hadith of the gathering? Whenever you remember Allah, Allah mentions them to you. Excellent. Excellent. Whenever you mention the name of Allah, Dhakar Allah, if you mention in the when you mention Allah, when Allah's name is mentioned in the gathering, then Allah will mention your name with the angels that are below him, closest to him. Allah says in the Quran, Fathkuruni. Remember me, I will remember you. Allah says in a hadith Qudsi, Qasamtu salat bain wa bain abdi nisfain. I have split the salah between me and my servant in two. So when he says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah from above his arsh subhana 
says, this man here, he has praised me. When you say Rahman and Rahim, he has praised me again. When you say Maliki Umiddin, he has made me the king. He's given me the glory and honor. When you say Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in, Allah says, this is between me and him. This is between me and him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about you. Sirat al-Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqim Sirat al-Ladina Alam Tani this is for my servant and I'll give him what he wants. This is the two parts. The first part, you are talking about Allah. Allah talks about you back. The second part, you are asking oh Allah, please give me this. Make me firm. Make me other people of Tawheed who have all of these things that we've been talking about. And don't let it leave me, Allah. This is what he wants, I will give it to him. But the question here now is that how do we know Allah is talking about us? There are signs in the dunya that you can know that Allah is talking about you. And when Allah is talking about you, He is accepting you because there is no other reason why He would be talking about you. The ulama have said there's two ways or two things that are needed for you to remain on this way. And if you have these two things, then you will know that Allah has accepted. You will know that Allah is talking about you if you have these two things in your life. Number one, Al-Ikhlas What's Ikhlas? I think we talked about this before That we do things sincerely for Allah Is that Ikhlas? Sincerity But now, what is sincerity? Ikhlas, sincerity, translation But what is sincerity now? Even in English, what is sincerity? Solely done for the sake of Allah Good We want to do it to make Allah happy Is that enough? The ulama have mentioned that Al-Ikhlas has two parts to it and unless you have these two parts, you're not a true mukhlis. Number one, you do it for the sake of Allah to make him happy. Number two, you do it to enter into his jannah and to save yourself from his anger and his punishment. That is an ikhlas. Now you think, yeah, maybe that's obvious. Why do we need to have these conversations? Why do we need these conditions? I'll tell you why these conditions are very important. One of the biggest problems that we're facing now as Muslims in the UK, we have a new generation, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. I've met a lot of them, and inshallah nobody in this room, alhamdulillah, we've got very nice faces here, but a lot of people, they don't want to do anything. They don't want to do anything. Go and learn. They will go to learn, they will go to college, but go and work, go get a job. Work eight hours. Eight hours, you're asking me to work eight hours. But then he's on his nice phone, very expensive phone, nice designer clothes, he wants the car, he wants everything. How are you going to get it all? I'll become a football player. How are you going to get it all? Ah, I'll open up, uh, what's this, YouTube, what's it called, blogging. Or I'll start putting videos and I'll get the hits. People, they don't want to work. People are not motivated. This is not even just Muslims. This is a problem in our whole society. People are addicted to their phones, and even when they're at work, they're not doing their job properly. When they go home, families are getting broken up because either the children are addicted, or the wife is addicted, or the husband is addicted to their mobile phones. And from that, there are, if there are people who are not Muslim or they're weak Muslim, then you'll find other things coming out from that. Because people are not motivated. The person of Tawheed remains motivated. Why? Because he knows what ikhlas is, but other people do not know what ikhlas is. So it doesn't matter what situation he is in his life, he remains motivated. Why? Because of the virtue of tawheed. And this is something that we need to teach ourselves, we need to teach our children, we need to keep talking about on a daily basis. You, my son, you have to remain a good person because I want to be with you in Jannah. Because it is possible, my brothers and sisters, we've got people that we love a lot in our lives. We have our mothers, we have our fathers, we have our children. But it is possible that the moment you die or the moment they die, you will never see them again. Is it true? They will be somewhere else, you will be somewhere else. And the people of Jannah, they will not have any kind of uh, resentment because Allah will purify their hearts and they will have joy. So imagine being in Jannah for all of eternity and your mother is not there. You're not going to be harmed. 
Because Allah is going to put in you joy. Your son is not there. Your daughter is not there. They're somewhere else. And you're not even thinking about it. The most beloved thing, person in your life could be separated with you for eternity based on what? Tawheed. So how can we make sure that you leave them with Tawheed? And that you give them Tawheed, you need to teach them the importance of Ikhlas. And that will keep them motivated. Whether you're there, whether you're not there. When you pass away, when he becomes 20, 30, 40 years old, keep them, keep telling them that, look, we need to do whatever it takes to make Allah happy. And that will keep you motivated. And that will remind you that here, this is not the point. We're moving somewhere else. And we live together there. That's the first thing. That's the first thing you need to know and have in your life to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted your deeds and He is talking about you. The second thing that is needed is something called taqwa. Now this is a word that comes over again in the Quran and I'm sure we know what we've heard it before but does anybody know what taqwa is? What is taqwa? Nobody heard of taqwa before? Yeah, what is taqwa? Sincerity. That is a class. Fear Allah. Good. Taqwa, fear Allah. But what is fear Allah? You're probably finding someone in the mosque saying taqwa is God consciousness. Being conscious of. But what does that mean? I sit there thinking about God all the time. Yeah. Does it mean um, Allah is aware of everything that you do? Allah is aware of that. But the, what does that mean for you? We know that Allah is all aware. So that you are aware of, what you, of your actions. Excellent. Taqwa means that you do the right thing. You stay away from what is haram. And you do what is commanded or permissible. So now with ikhlas, motivation. And with taqwa, you are telling your children. Right, listen. The reason why you are being brought into this dunya is to make Allah happy and whatever you do in the dunya no matter how rich you become it's not going to be enough it's not going to be the pleasure your pleasure is somewhere else seek that pleasure that is a class and that motivates them this dunya is not the reason but then how do we know that when you have turned your back they might not fall into something haram how do we know that they will continue on that way of the class how do we know that the person, sometimes they have a class inside, genuinely, some people have a class inside, but they have no taqwa in their actions. It's because they don't know what taqwa is. Taqwa, you need to instill in yourself and your children, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter, wherever you are in this world, make sure you do the right thing. And don't do things which Allah will not be pleased with. If you do that, this will help you in your ikhlas. If you have ikhlas, it will help you in your taqwa. Ikhlas is your internal motivation, ambition. Taqwa is what you do with your actions. If you can do that for yourself, if you can do that for your family members, you have nothing to worry about. And you will be with them in Jannah. And this is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But these two things are needed for us to be successful in the dunya. These two things are needed for us to know that Allah has accepted from us. These two things are needed to know that Allah is talking about us. Those people that Allah has guided, Allah will increase them in hidayah, in guidance, in ikhlas. Allah will give them the taqwa. So how do we know that we have tawheed? How do we know we know the purpose of our life? How do we know we are not falling into shirk? How do we know that our actions are good? These are all, this is a summary now. Point number three, how do we know that we are being good human beings? How do we know that we are being consistent and being steadfast and having sabr? How do we know this? How do we know, point number five, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted all four from us? How do we know? It's through the person having ikhlas and taqwa. And when the person has a class in taqwa, he will see himself improving. This is the fifth point. Improving. 
And when a day goes by, you think, yes, I've done something else now, this is good. And you have a chart in your head, maybe even write it down, there's nothing wrong with that. These are the things I need to work on, these are the things I need to remove. And when you see yourself developing and improving in that way, then you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Allah has given them increasing guidance. Allah has given them increase in ikhlas. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them the taqwa. Ask Allah to make us of the people of Iman and Tawheed. Ask Allah that He accepts us and He makes us of those people who know their purpose in life and that He protects us and our family members from shirk and that He keeps us firm upon His way in this dunya until we meet Him in the Akhirah. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We've got time for questions or anything? Sure. Questions? Jazakallah, Shaykh Khalid. Allah for the great messages that you told us. today we're going to begin the Q&A maybe around approximately 10 minutes, inshaAllah. So if sisters have any questions, write them down and we can pass them over, inshaAllah. What is Tawheed? We were forgotten. What is Tawheed? Tawheed is the Allah is the creator, Allah is the sustainer. What type of Tawheed is this? Good answer, well done. What, what type of Tawheed is this? Rububiyya. Yeah. What's your name, brother? Ayub. Ayub. Do you have your hand up? Um, I was going to say, um, I've got a question. Okay, question. Um, you know, um, say some three family members that are like relatives, not close, as in like cousins and first cousins, best cousins. How could you teach them about Tawheed if you don't see them? If you don't see them? Yeah, in a different context, don't you see them? Okay, so now the question is, how can we teach people about Tawheed if we do not live with them or, you know, via a long distance? I think the, probably the best message for this one now is to share links with them, share talks with them, maybe even buy books for them and have it sent to their address. Uh, you know, you can get Kitab of Tawheed in every single language now. Pick one which is easy to understand send it to their address, talk to them about the importance, share links, etc. And encourage people to learn the Qur'an in Arabic, learn the Qur'an or at least read it in their language. How many times is the name Allah mentioned in the Qur'an? There are 114 chapters and every chapter starts with Bismillah, so there are at least 114. But the ulama mentioned more than 200 times. But then if you ask them, what is Allah, what does Allah mean, what does Rabb mean, all these things. So now start engaging in those kind of conversations. But do it bit by bit. But I think uh, asking questions and bringing up short discussions to intrigue people is very good. So I think that's a good technique that you can also use. And uh, the biggest thing that you can do is to make dua. That is the biggest thing that you could do. I've got a question for myself. Can I ask a question to myself? What is the ruling on celebrating festivals which are against Tawheed? Oh, sorry. Sorry. I'll wait for an What's the answer? The answer is, now, Ibn, Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, he says something which is very important. Number one, he says that in Islam, festivals only come after act of worship. Ramadan and the ten or the nine days of uh, Dhul Hijj. Therefore, we celebrate completing acts of worship. We celebrate our du'a being accepted. We celebrate being free from the hellfire. We celebrate acceptance. All these things that we just talked about, the purpose and staying in the being good and helping one another and becoming better and remaining steadfast and seeking to improve. That's what we celebrate. That's what Eid is about. 
So this is something which is very important, that people can't get involved with just celebrating anything. The second thing that I want to say about this is that the problem is that always in the last week or the second last week of December people start asking what is the ruling on saying uh, happy greetings and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, what is the ruling on all that? Can I do that? Can I give them a gift? Can I accept a gift? But January, February, March, no question. Why? This is, this is the problem. The problem is, if I have my friend here, John, and I work with him, or he's my neighbour, or he's my family member, John, December is the only time he contacts me. And he says, come to my house, we're having a Christmas party. Or I speak to him throughout the whole year, and I've never talked to him about Islam, I've never talked about anything. And sometimes, I'm bad towards him sometimes. When it comes to December, because he's your friend, he's your family member or something, he will say, well, we're having a party, or here is a gift. And if you don't say it back, he will become very offended. Why is the problem here? The problem here is that the Prophet ﷺ, throughout the whole year, he was good to his non-Muslim family members. So if it is February, if it is March, you give him a gift. You are nice to him. Call him to your house. You go to his house. You do things together which are halal and good. And if you can't do that, because some people, most people, not most non-Muslims will do things that we can't do perhaps, but still you have nice talking with him, nice interactions with him. When it comes to December the 20th, he says there's a Christmas party or there is a Christmas gift and you say to him, listen John, this is my religion and this is what it teaches us and I don't mean to offend you because you are my friend but I can't, I can't do it. How do you think he will behave? He will accept it, he will appreciate your honesty, maybe he might even understand what you are saying. He might even think, well that is a good point what he is saying. But if it comes right to the end and he's never seen anything good from you and you've never talked to him about Tawheed before and then all of a sudden say, sorry, I don't celebrate Christmas and all of those things then the problem is from ourselves. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik shalala ilaha ila antashtakhtu wa tukhu ilayk Barakallah fikum, jazakallah khair for having me sorry for talking at length and inshallah this will not be the last time. Inshallah. Barakallah fikum.